Sure. Okay. okay we're ready to roll. Uh, so, hi everyone. Um, welcome to the GCPE Spring Lecture Series. I'm gonna make you endure a brief message from our sponsor before we get to the, to the more interesting parts of the evening. My name is Eve Barron. I'm the chair of Pratt Institute's Graduate Center for Planning and the Environment, which is an interdisciplinary department made up of four related programs in historic preservation, sustainable environmental systems, urban placemaking and management, and city and regional planning. So we have deep, deep roots in the community development world. We're practice oriented and we teach participatory process as the best way to support and advocate for just sustainable neighborhoods and communities. The spring lecture series is representative of the type of interdisciplinary collaborative dialogue that's essential to this educational approach. Each, each spring we bring together cross sections of people um, that include community organizing, policy making, technical experts, decision makers, labor leaders, advocates to unpack the issues and bring forward solutions. Tonight's panel is the second in the series, an equitable recovery agenda for New York, which is definitely one of the most pressing challenges in a generation or more. And we're pleased to once again partner with the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance to curate and moderate these panels. Um, I also wanted to give a shout out to Amon Lee, Delaney Morris, and Meredith Tenhoor for additional support um, on the back end of these lectures. Appreciate that very much. Um, so tonight's distinguished panelists, which includes uh, a GCP alumni, uh, will be moderated by Ron Schiffman and Eddie Bautista, certainly distinguished in their own rights. Um, many of you might know that Ron co-founded the Pratt Institute Center for Community and Environmental Development which is today the oldest continuously operating university-based community design um, and development center in the US. He participated in the creation of the country's first community development corporation, the bed -Stuy Restoration Corporation. He served on the New York City Planning Commission from 1990 to 1996, and he is an award-winning planner, a community development specialist, and lifelong civil rights advocate. We are proud to have him as a professor emeritus at GCPE. Um, and Eddie Bautista is the executive director of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. And that's a citywide network of community-based organizations of color advocating for the empowerment of environmentally overburdened neighborhoods. Think of just about any equity gener generating environmental policy advancement and Eddie's had a hand in it, whether it was the Brownfield Opportunity Area Program in New York State, the Solid Waste Management Plan in New York City, the People's Climate March, the New York State Community Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which I never can get quite right. Um, but the list goes on for a long time. And we're very proud to claim you, Eddie, as an alumni of the City Regional Planning Program and also now as a member of the faculty. So Eddie, I'm gonna turn it over to you to get the ball rolling. Uh, thanks so much, Eve. But um, before I begin, I thought we, uh, Ron, do you wanna say a few words before we, uh, we dive in? Well, I just want to wake. <laughs> I thought I was not going to say anything till the end, but I just wanted to basically uh, thank everybody for joining us today. And, uh, you know, we're really struggling with figuring out how we can put together a, an agenda that really takes advantage of the particular moment we're at. Uh, we we're beginning to see a little light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to the uh, pandemic that's affecting us. Uh, we have an economic uh, depression that is really having an adverse effect on low and moderate income communities. Even though the economy seems like it's booming on one level, it's what people are calling a K-shaped recovery with one group escalating uh, in wealth while the other is really suffering dramatically. And at the same time, we're experiencing a long overdue racial reckoning and readjustment. And how do we take advantage of all of these three things coming together to really uh, create a, or, or forge what can be a new agenda for an equitable recovery for New York and not only New York, uh, but for the country. Uh, New York for a long period of time was always a leader. Uh, we think we should become a leader again. And so a lot of the work that the environmental justice movement has been doing uh, 
coupled with some of the work that the community-based organizations in New York City have been able to do, has given us a template at least on how to move forward. And that's uh, some of the things that we're going to see today. We've got a unique opportunity this year. Uh, we have a new administration in Washington. We definitely will have a new administration in the city of New York. Uh, you know, within the next few months, we'll be selecting that leadership. And then uh, who knows when we'll be having a new governor. It may be sooner than later. Uh, but the, it's rare that we see the convergence of three different levels of government opening up at the same time with new administration and new leadership. So this is the time to forge that agenda. And so I hope that you all listen carefully to the speakers today and uh, pick up ideas from them because they've accomplished quite a bit over the last year and we could use some of the lessons uh, they've learned and some of the ideas I have to move forward. And then finally, uh, I'll recap this at the very end, uh, but we're uh, next on April 9th, we're going to have another panel on housing as a right. Uh, and I'll leave it at that and turn it over to Eddie. Thanks, Ron. Uh, yeah, it wouldn't be a prep lecture if we didn't begin with 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 some Ron w uh, wisdom being dropped on the group. Uh, so thank you, Ron, and and he will be uh, uh, participating with us later in the program. Um, before we begin, um, I, you know we've we've all been um, uh, shockingly um, aware and and outraged by the the incidences of violence, not just. Uh, the worst of it, which happened this week in, in Atlanta, but um, it's been happening um, uh, for for months um, uh, with literally thousands of incidences across the country. Uh, so before we begin, I'd, I'd like to ask everyone to uh, um, uh, indulge, indulge us all in a, in a moment of silence for the victims in Atlanta and uh, and just sending uh, um, prayers and, and, and love to our Asian um, um, family. Uh, so uh, this is pause. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you all. Um, so uh, I also want to thank uh, the, uh, there's some regulars here that have uh, been joining uh, the Pratt Lecture Series, uh, the Pratt and Nija, New York City Environmental Justice Alliance Lecture Series for the last few years. Uh, so we, we welcome our, our usual suspects as well as uh, folks who may be joining us for the first time. Um, as Ron mentioned, uh, we are at the intersection of multiple crises. Um, but as we've been, as was uh, first articulated in the first workshop and, and, and folks will get uh, an even deeper understanding uh, in tonight's workshop, um, there are crises that you can literally build your way out of. Um, and the climate justice, environmental justice movements uh, have been leading the way um, uh, in exactly how to, how, we, how to accomplish that. And what's been even more in many ways um, gratifying is the central role the New York State, the New York environmental and climate justice movements have been making. Um, and, and to uh, clarify uh, how that's played out, uh, we're joined by a stellar panel. Um, uh, I will say that I'm going to hesitate and try not to, because all of us have been on a call with each other several calls at least in the last few days. So we're going to try to pretend that we've not been on a call literally about an hour or two ago and pretend that otherwise we don't want this to turn into a, a New York Renews, Nija, Uprose or, um, or New York Lawyers uh, conference call. It could eat. And by the way, if it was that, y'all would still have fun. So I'm just saying. Um, so let's begin. Uh, we have, uh, I'm not going to read everyone's uh, bios. Um, it, it should be dropped into the, uh, into the chat. I do urge everyone to read their bios in full. Um, it, these are really some amazing leaders that we have joining us tonight. Um, I'm, I'm going to, I'll begin by reading a line or two, but, but, you know, believe me, the line or two that I will read is just the uh, uh, tip of the iceberg with these folks. And yes, that was a hokey climate change reference. Apologies. Uh, so, we will begin um, with um, uh, my my uh, my closest ally on this call, Anel Hernandez, who is the associate director of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Anel works on city and statewide climate policy issues, focusing on local advocacy and research, 
that further equitable investments in coastal resiliency, green infrastructure, renewable energy, and resilient energy systems. She also works on various coalition campaigns to push for more aggressive climate legislation with equity as a central focus. Um, as I said, there's more to Anel's bio. I, I urge people to uh, read uh, hers and the others. Uh, but without further ado, um, Anel Hernandez, como esta? Great. Thanks so much, Eddie. And hi, everyone. Happy to be here tonight. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen to get started with the presentation. All right, so as Eddie mentioned, my name is Anel Hernandez. I'm the Associate Director of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. We were founded in 1991, so we're actually at 30 years <laughs> this year, which is exciting. And we are a um, network of community-based organizations across New York City. Right now we have 11 members in Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, and the Bronx. I know I saw some of them are even here tonight. So, hey, Nija family. Um, <laughs> in Brooklyn, we have Uprose, Brooklyn Movement Center, and El Puente. In Queens, we have Chaya CDC. In the Bronx, we have Youth Ministries for Peace and Justice, Green Worker Co-ops, Nos Quedamos, and the Point CDC. And in Manhattan, we have Sanitation Coalition, Community Voices Heard, and Goals. And each of our member organizations do a lot of critical, important on the ground work, ranging from youth programs, to housing issues, uh, to co-ops, and really the list goes on. Truly amazing um, community level work that our members are leading. And our role is really to bring them together around the shared environmental burdens and climate vulnerabilities that impact all of our communities and really uplift the solutions that communities of color and low income communities want to see. So over the past few years, we have released our New York City Climate Justice Agenda series, where we do an in-depth analysis of uh, the City of New York's One NYC report, essentially their sustainability and resiliency blueprint. Um, we assess very critically um, where they're falling short, where they're doing okay, and where they need to do more. And this is across a variety of issue areas, um, Forgive the merengue in the background, that's just my street. Um, <laughs> and this is across a variety of different areas from um, solid waste to transportation to energy issues to resiliency issues, really runs the gamut. And over the past few years, we've also um, really began to look a lot uh, at New York state policy and how that is impacting um, how we shift away from fossil fuels and become more resilient in New York City. And so last year we received, we released the Climate Justice Agenda 2020, focus on three main themes. Um, number one, reducing greenhouse gases, and of course, reducing localized emissions and co-pollutants, advancing a just transition toward a renewable and regenerative economy, and cultivating healthy and resilient communities. And so there's a lot in this report, and I, I definitely suggest that folks check it out, go into it and see all of the different sections, but I'll focus on a few areas and, and highlight some of that work today. Um, so first, first is um, one of our longest running campaigns, the Waterfront Justice Projects, where we continually highlight the disproportionate um, storm surge vulnerability faced by our industrial waterfronts, specifically the significant maritime and industrial areas and the communities adjacent to that areas, to those areas. Um, the New York City Panel on Climate Change's most recent report showed that sea level rise, tidal patterns, flooding, and storm surge will increasingly threaten New York City's coastlines. And that threat is just gonna continue to increase and these industrial vulnerabilities compound that risk. It's like a secondary hazard caused by storm surge. And we really want um, more intentional research and action around these vulnerabilities really supported by the community-based research that many of our members are already conducting. We also wanna make sure that all the coastal resiliency investments that the city is doing is equitable across the five boroughs. To date, the majority of funding for coastal protection has gone to lower Manhattan, 
close to a billion dollars so far, where me whereas many other communities like Hunts Point, like North Brooklyn, East Harlem and Sunset Park have really not received any funding to do actual projects. They have received some funding for feasibility studies and things like that, but there really have been left out of that um, funding stream, which is really problematic. So we want um, the city, we want the state, and now with the new federal administration, we want the federal government to really support that five borough coastal resiliency. We also have been strongly advocating for more nature-based infrastructure and shoreline interventions to deal with these disproportionate climate burdens. Um, the Army Corps of Engineer has been proposing a seawall at the, at the mouth of New York Harbor, and that's not what we wanna see. We don't know what the impacts of that would potentially be. The cost of that infrastructure ranges from 50 billion to up to 119 billion. And we can take those resources instead of putting it in one giant piece of infrastructure and really um, support equitable infrastructure and nature-based infrastructure across the city. We want these investments to benefit New Yorkers, not just during an extreme weather event or during a hurricane. We want investments that would benefit com environmental justice communities every single day of the year. One of the other major impacts that New York City is facing is extreme heat. And this was further compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic and the fact that you know, people had to stay home, um, the fact that many environmental justice communities lack open space, um, the fact that people are already struggling with their utility bills. So we advocated for an expansion of utility bill assistance and making sure that the city was addressing these really um, dangerous vulnerabilities. And so um, in part due to our advocacy, the de Blasio administration announced the purchase of 74,000 air conditioners for the city's poorest and most heat vulnerable New Yorkers. The city council passed um, a series of bills to better publicly track how extreme heat is impacting vulnerable communities and also legislation to bring us closer to protecting New York City's most vulnerable communities through improved planning and cooling sensors and things like that. We also um, were very happy to see that the state government expanded access to utility bill assistance so that you know, folks that are struggling with their energy bills can access those funds during the summer months as well. And so another long-term strategy to deal with extreme heat is really investing in street trees and investing in our urban forest. As many of us know, trees have the ability to store and absorb carbon that drive the climate crisis, but also to absorb harmful localized co-pollutants like particulate matter that affect respiratory health in EJ communities. They provide cooling and shade in the community. Um, and so we want to see the city do a very intentional investment in um, street trees and our urban forest. Um, you know, they committed to some of that through Cool Neighborhoods NYC, but we really haven't seen that pan out. We don't know where that is, and it's just not enough. We need to really advance and catalyze these investments in the most heat vulnerable communities. And you can see it um, on the two maps here. The one on the right shows heat vulnerability across New York City. You can see that the South Bronx, um, Central Brooklyn and Upper Manhattan are some of the most impacted communities. And then on the left, you can see that those same communities are, have also very low urban canopy coverage. That really contributes to the fact that you know, they are so heat vulnerable. And all of this is being further exacerbated by COVID-19 budget cuts at the city level. Um, they're not valuing the urban forest enough at a time where we need it most. Um, and this is also a place where we can create new jobs in both you know, uh, street trees, but also in these coastal protection um, investments. There's a lot of nature-based jobs there that we should be thinking about intentionally. Um, and then all of these issues also intersect with the energy system and um, the continued use of fossil fuel, the continued pollution in our communities on a day where we have a heat wave, um, air quality is already poor because of the heat, and then the city turns on these peaker plants that are some of the most polluting fossil fuel power plants in New York City, and it really just exacerbates the issue.
NPCC also projects that the number of 90 degree days is gonna double and the number of heat waves triple or even quadruple. So we really need to um, look at these issues comprehensively. Um, and as I said, peaker plants are some of the most polluting um, fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, it emits localized pollutants such as NOx and SOx, which are both directly harmful and contribute to the secondary formation of ozone and PM 2.5. And these emission reductions, if we're able to shut down these peaker plants, which we have the technology available and we have the law in place to make it happen, it really can begin to address some of the disproportionate public health outcomes that we've seen. For example, in the South Bronx, childhood asthma rates are nearly double the citywide average. And the graphic on the right just shows the, the sheer amount of carbon emissions, NOx emissions, and SOx emissions that come from the fleet of 16 peakers in New York City. And so New York Renews, and, and Stefan will talk a, a lot more about this, but NIJA was you know, one of the founding organizations of New York Renews, which we've grown so much over the past few years. We've had so many rallies, so many events from Long Island to Brooklyn, to the Bronx, to Buffalo and, and beyond. Um, we've centered frontline communities and communities of color um, in all of our work. Um, here are more pictures, and there's so many of all of the different events that we've had uh, throughout the years. Um, and we were able to pass the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which I won't go into because Stefan will. <laughs> but of course, it's not just about reducing emissions, it's also about investing in frontline communities, in EJ communities, and setting aggressive targets to get us there. We were also part of the Climate Works for All Coalition that also helped um, push forward the Climate Mobilization Act, one of the actually the most aggressive energy efficiency law in the country, um, while ensuring that we're also protecting the affordability of apartments in New York City. And this is a big one. And while there, they are two huge wins, there's still so much work to be done to ensure that they're implemented appropriately and implemented equitably and quickly. <laughs> and then, so the last thing I will leave you with is the Renewable Rikers Act, which was passed last month. We were very excited. We got the city council to pass a series of bill to ensure that the jail is going to close by 2027 and um, be utilized for sustainability and resiliency purposes. We see this as a model for a just transition. We see this as an opportunity for restorative justice. And we see this as part of the larger vision to catalyze renewable energy in New York City. We have limited amount of public space and public land in New York City, and this provides um, over 400 acres of land that we can utilize um, to model what a just transition should be. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Anel. Um, and as, as Anel laid out, not just the um, uh, NIJA's New York City climate justice agenda, but, but touched on climate works for all and New York Renews, um, what, what's important is tying all this together to um, the, you know, the title of tonight's workshop, right, is the intersection of climate justice and economic justice. Um, when Anel mentions just transitions, that is core to our climate advocacy um, uh, priorities, um, and not just obviously the Environmental Justice Alliance, but movement wide, right? Um, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with just transitions, um, when you hear Green New Deal, what that essentially attempts to frame is what a just transition, uh, and that's the frame that the environmental and climate justice movements have used literally for decades now. So if you if you know you don't quite get just transitions, what a Green New Deal purports to be is what a just transition framework. Um, that was you know, created by our movements um, um, attempts to advance. Um, so it was important to begin with, with Nija's work because it is a snapshot. And what's really important is that all of the initiatives that Anel was laying out, all of them create literally tens of thousands of jobs. 
Um, so it's again, when, when, as I began the uh, the evening, we talked about how um, it's not all the time that you could find crises that you can literally build your way out of, um, and 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 the climate crisis is certainly that. Um, so we begin with Nija, and let's turn to how the environmental and climate justice movements. Um, you know, a lot of the work that was happening in New York City and statewide, how all that got knitted together and what became New York Renews. So let me um, introduce Stefan. Uh, Stefan Adel is the campaign coordinator for New York Renews. Before coming to New York Renews, Stefan was the New York project director for Working Families. He previously worked as a union and community organizer before attending law school to better understand the legal, me the legal mechanisms that impact and often marginalized working class communities and small businesses. Uh, Stefan has a JD from, uh, Q from CUNY School of Law. He also holds a master's degree in global politics from Birkbeck College of the University of London. Stefan, welcome brother. Thank you. Um, and I'm very honored to be here today and uh, always an exciting time to share the stage with these great speakers. Um, I'm gonna see if I can remember how to share my screen. And there we go. Hopefully that works. Um, and I'm just going to start uh, with just two word, a few words about New York Renews. Um, Eddie and many others tell this story, and it could be its own uh, 10, 15 minute presentation. But coming out of many, many struggles, uh, advocates, environmental justice organizations, labor unions, community groups, faith leaders, and others all across the state. Um, knew that we needed to start working together as a statewide coalition to really be able to ramp up what we could accomplish. And New York Renews is sort of the fruit that came from that effort after years of work by folks, uh, Eddie, one of those key leaders. We're now 250 or more organizations around the state um, with tens of thousands of members working really hard on a whole series of campaigns that like the work Nija does, grow out of grassroots leadership um, and um, the coalition was built uh, around key points of unity um, and the Hamez principles. And I encourage everybody um, to look into the Hamez principles. They were principles developed by the environmental justice movement and really have been central to our ability to bring together really diverse groups across the state and work together effectively. The coalition is aimed at moving us towards 100% just clean renewable energy future and one that is actually built on just economic relationships on transitioning our communities and supporting each other across this movement. Um, it is not enough to transition off fossil fuels. It has to be just. And we know that without advocacy, that is not going to happen. We know there will be recovery plans for this current moment. We just also know that if we're not fighting hard for them at the city, state, and federal level, that they are going to be determined by people who don't care about our communities. So building on all the work that um, other panelists are going to be talking about, New Yorker News centrally focused on identifying the solutions and the framework for state level legislative action. Um, and we came at, and it was mentioned earlier to kind of two core areas. We need to start off by mandating the transition. Um, it is not enough to have goals. It's not enough to have spending programs. We need a legal mandate on the state. And so this climate, what became the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, the CLCPA, um, took many years of work by many people and really four years of dedicated work by the coalition as it grew and built power. It sets the strongest emission standards in the country. It sets clear legal mandates, but it also creates really clear or <laughs> we're working to make them really clear in implementation requirements that every piece of the state government work to make our state both more climate resilient, more climate adaptive to reduce emissions and to do it equitably. And we can talk more um, about how we do that. The goal was really to create those legal mandates and a toolbox for us as we move forward. And the goals of the bill are, are complex, but also really simple, right? We need to get off fossil fuels. We need to cut our emissions. It sets a legal mandate uh, of essentially decarbonizing. It sets a goal of 100%, but legally mandates that the state must get our emissions cut by 85% by 2050, and that includes all greenhouse gas emissions. It also requires the state to agencies and authorities across the board to begin looking at and reducing cumulative burdens on communities 
and may, and decide whether any future action they take is going to help not just with reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, but with transitioning our economy to a more just one with less burdens on environmental justice communities. It requires dedicated funding um, and, and a really um, very contentious at the moment effort to make sure that the state lives up to the legal mandate to put 40% of our resources around climate, around energy, around adaption into the communities that need it most. And it requires participatory processes. The, the state um, requires a lot of work to do that. And so we've been working uh, to both get the state as we work to implement it, to ramp up spending. We were in Albany last year during the budget and this year during the budget. Uh, this picture is from last year when we could be there in person um, and really trying to make it real. The, cent the uh, CLCPA creates a process where community members, advocates, folks like Eddie and Anel all across the state are involved in actually making it happen. Uh, the Climate Action Council uh, includes leaders from the coalition, as do all the advisory panels. The central one central piece of the CLCPA is to require this transparent and community involved. I was about to say community led, and it certainly isn't quite there, despite our best efforts, um, to have a plan developed over the next two years to lead New York off of fossil fuels. The Climate Action Council is 22 people. It includes leaders of the coalition, like Ryan Salter on our team at New York Renews and P um, Peter Wanowitz at Environmental Advocates, the Just Transition Working Group and other bodies that are gonna help put that together. And that every single one of those bodies has community leaders that we've been working with who are leaders in New York Renews and of environmental justice groups, community groups and unions. That process is ongoing and it's really, it's a lot of work. Uh, I don't need to tell Anel or any of the other folks here who are working on making this happen, how much work is involved in transforming the entire economy of the state. Um, but that's really what's happening. And if we aren't doing it, um, then it's not gonna happen. But there are tremendous opportunities there. And we know that in this moment that we can continue to advocate for not just doing it right, but also for those transition to lead us to a better place economically, to a place where we are going to be able to do the work that we need to make this recovery build, uh, build for our communities. Um, and we know that when we stand together, we can win. We won with the CLCPA and we're going to keep winning, uh, both in implementation of it and with our next legislative priority. And I'm not really keeping track of time, so I'm going to go really quickly through this part because I'm not sure how much time I have left. Um, the Climate and Community Investment Act, which we are fighting for in the legislature right this moment, we're looking for amendments right now, would generate 10 to $15 billion of economic investment in our communities focused on a tr just transition. Um, we're, it collects that money through revenue mechanisms and puts that into frontline communities, which are prioritized for the renewable energy system, for the work that needs to be done as part of this recovery. Um, thank you. We. Um, we spent a lot of time over the last four years, even as we were fighting for the CLCPA, working with community groups, experts, advocates, uh, community members to really think through what does this just transition need and to build out the workforce, the opportunities that are gonna make this transition moment happen in a way that's just. And we know that we need billions of dollars for this to happen. But that can't just mean more offshore wind turbines, as important they are. It can't just mean money for a seawall. It has to mean money that goes to communities for projects that they determine. It means we have to have efforts that actually are centering the voices of those who have been most impacted by cumulative burdens. So among other things, the programs that it would fund include billions of dollars for community-based organizations and local communities to do the work that they need for resiliency, emission reduction, or economic development around this. Um, there are four core spending areas the bill would create, and we're really doing our best to make sure that this is going to have a big bang. So I'll talk more in a moment about how you can get involved because I wouldn't be a great organizer if I didn't make a pitch, uh, even though that's not the focus today. Um, but the bill includes, uh, as I said, would raise about 10 to $15 billion. And it includes 30% of that funding going to green jobs and infrastructure. Um, it includes a community just transition fund where that would provide direct grants to communities in disadvantaged communities uh, disadvantaged communities, environmental justice communities, 
based on their determination of what they need. It requires the state to provide a third of those funds as rebates to local small businesses, to low income and moderate income households, who we know that this energy transition is going to put a burden on, even though the focus of the spending and the work is going to be on protecting them. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that they were additionally supported and actually come out ahead. And then finally sets up the state's first and one of the nation's first direct uh, funding sources and programs for impacted workers and host communities. We know that people are going to need support to get from the um, working in the uh, fossil fuel economy, whether that's at power plants or in manufacturing, whether it's driving a bus potentially into the new economy. And so this provides funding both for workers to get new jobs, for communities to support all of their services while those jobs are being created and for businesses and, and public services to be transitioned off of fossil fuels. Um, it does this all while securing the funding and making sure it's not caught up in the Albany budget fights. It does it by streamlining it and making sure the communities have a real role. It attaches labor standards, responsible contracting standards, wage provisions, local hiring to that money as much as allowed by law. And it really works to align with racial and social justice movements. As has been mentioned, this has been a year for reckoning and we need to be thinking really broadly about what this transition looks like. It's not just getting off fossil fuels, but it means actually thinking seriously about investing in the care economy. It means not investing in prisons and policing where we know that that is not the kind of support our community needs. Um, you can help us make this happen. Uh, and um, we have a week of action coming up. The bill, uh, the amendments to the bill should be introduced any day now. The bill is in the Senate and we are fighting for it. Um, and we expect to have some real momentum uh, coming out of the budget season. We will um, be starting at the beginning of April to be, have a huge week of action. We hope all of you will join us uh, from the 5th to the 9th and you can find out more on newyorkernews.org. This is a pivotal moment for us and we know that this is not just as was said about New York State, right? What happens at the state level in New York is gonna determine the possibilities at the city level, at every city level across the state. It also is having a huge impact at the federal level. We know that we've seen language from the CLCPA show up in federal conversations and in this federal executive order that the president did on environmental justice. We've seen that language begin to be echoed in other states in regulatory proceedings and in legislation. And we know that New York is positioned to be a real leader here. And so there's a moment now where we can use this political transition and really make tremendous change happen, not just in New York, but all across the country. So thank you for the opportunity to talk today. And now I have Thanks to figure so out much, how to stop Stephen. sharing my screen. Thanks so much, Stefan. Um, and and we, we wanted to begin with, with the known Stefan um, uh, to, to, to just kind of chart um, how kind of at, at least at the New York City level, how environmental and climate justice um, uh, policy shifts uh, have been happening over the last several years, uh, but also how it's influenced the state. I mean, whether it's the New York City Climate Mobilization Act, as and I'll mention, uh, the most ambitious energy efficiency mandate by any city in the United States, or the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act that Stefan just talked about, the most ambitious climate action plan among the states, and some people say even globally. Um, uh, New York has now leapfrogged over California to take a lead. And what's really, really interesting is that the CLCPA is the first climate, first piece of climate legislation uh, to move in New York State in over 10 years. And that this was driven by the priorities and the values of grassroots organizations doing environmental and climate justice work across, uh, across the state. All of this stuff, um, happens because we have uh, we have visionary uh, and innovative leadership at the community grassroots level, um, which is the way I now am teeing up our next speaker, uh, Summer Sandoval. Um, Summer Sandoval from Uprose. Summer Sandoval was born and raised in Southern Maryland and came to New York City to earn a bachelor's uh, in environmental science from NYU. In New York City, uh, Summer developed her understanding and passion for environmental justice issues. In 2019, Summer completed her Master's of Science in Sustainable Environmental Systems at Pratt Institute. Yeah, of course, a little plug for Pratt. 
Yo, okay. Um, and started her position as the energy democracy coordinator at Uprose. In this role, Summer leads many of the energy democracy campaigns from developing Sunset Park Solar, New York's first solar cooperative, to fighting peak or power plants with the peak coalition and implementing a just a local just transition. Uh, and Uprose, of course, is also a member of NIJA and a co-founder of uh, New York Renews and Climate Works for All. Uh, so welcome, Summer. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Always super glad to be part of um, a Pratt alumni family. So let me start with screen share. Um, so yeah, really great to be here um, with everyone tonight. And I want to start off with introducing a little bit about Uprose um, and some of them, and then highlighting some of the major victories, climate justice victories we've had in the last year. Um, so founded in 1966. Uprose is Brooklyn's oldest Latino community-based organization. We're located in Sunset Park, um, southwest part of Brooklyn, um, a community of over 132,000. We are um, an intergenerational, multicultural, and woman of color-led organization working at the intersection of racial injustice and climate change. Um, I think we can all agree that 2020 has been arguably one of the most painful and difficult years of most of our lives, um, individually and as a nation and world, really. And, you know, going off of um, Eddie's introduction, this week has been particularly painful, um, having um, most of my Chinese family being located in and around Atlanta has made it extremely difficult. And um, I wanted to, wanting to really lift up that Asians have played a major role in the social, social justice movement. And the Asian struggle is also from the legacy of extraction, racism. Um, and so I really wanted to lift that up and um, that we have to be standing in solidarity um, with communities and not just Asian communities, but all of our communities across the country. And that's how we're really going to be stepping into shared power um, and really building a really great and big leaderful movement. Um, so with that, I want to kick off this presentation with victories because we really need it. Um, so last, last year I presented on this panel and I talked about the fight with the industry city rezoning, which many of you may be familiar with, and what kind of better sequel than to report back that it is a victory, that last fall we defeated the industry city rezoning. Um, and for those of you who don't know, this, is, this was a huge um, attempt by private developers to rezone 3.3 million square feet in New York City's largest significant maritime industrial area. New York City only has six remaining industrial areas and Sunset Park is home to the largest. And so pri private developers, including Jamestown Properties, wanted to rezone the area uh, for luxury, commercial, high-end uses that included hotels um, and add, and which would also add three new buildings, um, over um, 1.5 million square feet, uh, including uh, retail and other uses. And, it was in this seven year long fight that in the midst of COVID, in the midst of 2020, that there was this light that was with this victory shown that in these unprecedented times that we cannot afford to default to these conventional and traditional models of development that create um, low paying jobs that, um, perpetuate gentrification and displacement, and that we really need to be looking very closely at how we use space, investments, and policy to promote equity. And so with that victory, um, was, we won that victory, um, not only with the support of many in this room, um, but with an alternative, a community-led alternative called the Green Resilient Industrial District, at, which we call the GRID, and the grid is a comprehensive community-led plan and that really looks at how to preserve industrial character of our waterfront, cre retain and create well-paid working class jobs, what we call climate jobs um, that was mentioned. And these jobs are in renewable energy, energy efficiency, sustainable manufacturing, 
um, and so many more supply chain jobs that are going to be the jobs that are going to be building for climate adaptation, mitigation, and resilience, building for a climate future, not only in Sunset Park, in the city, for the state, and the region. And to support green industrial innovation and to also um, promote the climate resiliency and circular economy principles to really achieve a true um, regenerative economies. Um, the grid is also um, a replicable model, a model for a local model that can be scaled to city, regional, and even national level that looks at um, how to really operationalize the policies that Anel and Stefan really highlighted, the city's Climate Mobilization Act, as well as the state's Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, because these, these ambitious and groundbreaking pieces of legislation not only mandate emission with deep, deep emission reductions and allocate specific funding for clean energy development, there's also a major equity piece, um, particularly with the state legislation that mandates the minimum of 35 to 40% investments in environmental justice communities. And, and it's with those intentional investments that these climate jobs are going to be created. And that without the preservation of industrial spaces in our city, we are going to be significantly limiting the potential benefits of being able to host these types of climate jobs. The second victory I really want to highlight is offshore wind. Um, in the beginning of 2021, there was an announcement from New York State that $200 million was awarded to the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal to be transformed into an offshore wind hub, a staging and assembly port um, for the region. Offshore wind is something that Uppers has, been, has long advocated um, to bring into Sunset Park. And so we're really excited with this annou announcement and very engaged and committed to ensuring that the thousands of direct and indirect jobs related to offshore wind and the offshore wind industry um, is benefiting our communities, that we can create um, workforce development and training opportunities to ensure that um, these local jobs land within the community. And the third I wanna highlight um, <clears throat> going off of Anel, Anel's presentation is the Peak Coalition. Um, so just this week, we released uh, the second Peak Coalition report, the fossil fuel endgame. Here you see my favorite picture from the report um, <clears throat> through some guerrilla photography skills and a, um, a dedicated coworker got this picture. Uh, <laughs> but this is the Peaker plant right in Sunset Park. Sunset Park is, um, the reluctant host to three peaker power plants um, in the city. And this is one of them. Um, so definitely check out our new report um, and the Peak Coalition to learn more about a coalition of environmental justice, legal, technical um, ex experts working together on a comprehensive strategy to close the Pico plants across New York City, predominantly located in environmental justice communities. I wanted to share these top three um, victories, climate justice victories that were achieved in the last year. Um, you know, this, this, we understand um, that there is still so much work to be done, and this, it's easy to really get really burdened and bogged down with all of the negative and all of the um all the work that still needs to be done but so really wanted to lift up the um victories that within all of the hardship that we all in this room have worked together um you know reg regardless of situation this past year through personal um and professional loss and struggles and have achieved these really big um paramount moments in this next slide you might have seen before, this is um, a popular meme that has been going around the um, internet for a few months now. And I wanted to contextualize it a little bit more um, to have the deep understanding of where our work really fits in in regards to um, operationalizing the grid 
as part of a just transition, a community led vision for just transition and how that all works together within the system we live in today. Um, so many of you all know that the, through the COVID-19 pandemic, there was really the strong recognition of the, of the um, connection between health and infrastructure. We knew that COVID-19 was gonna be an environmental justice issue before these big university reports came out to tell us we were right. So what's kind of at the foundation of that? So here you see at the bottom added kind of the, the found some driving factors that have not only created these waves, but perpetuates the inequity that comes from these waves of multiple crises, the racial injust injustice, extraction, systemic oppression. This is just some, like the list could go on. Um, and to really also understand that these confounding crises have a different impact on different communities. So really wanted to also add the, that difference in impact here with this image, as you see in the top left, that you know, everyone was impacted by COVID and everyone to an extent is also impacted by climate change, but the extent of that impact is really uh, determined by other factors. And so really wanted to show that here. And here also show, depicting the same thing in a different way that all of these environmental justice issues and systemic issues have impacted frontline communities, communities of color, low income communities, climate vulnerable communities the most. And so when we talk about solutions, um, and here I titled this slide, a, a true just transition. Um, why a true just transition? In the last year, we've heard this word being used probably five times as much as we have um, the last five years prior not because it's new, um, because it's become kind of trendy. And so really wanting to address what a true just transition is, people look at the um, result. They highlight um, you know, a clean energy economy. It's just put, you know, installing panels and it's about emission reduction of clean energy development. And it's so a true just transition is really looking not at only the, um, the fuel base, you know, the energy, but looking at the political, economic, and, um, and power structures and shifting all of those systems away from the extractive model, not only one that is based in fossil fuels, but one that is based in top-down decision-making, um, disinvestment, and, you know, the list can go on, and to a regenerative economy that is centering equity, centering justice, that really looks at how we can um, really change the overall structure of decision making, and that the and the notion that frontline communities who have been on the front line of the climate crisis, the COVID nineteen crisis, and all of these crises need to be at the forefront of the solutions, and that doesn't mean for entities to come in and decide those solutions for community. That means centering community planning, community decision-making um, and, and movement of funds. And so that's one, one of the big takeaways I want to really emphasize um, in lifting these pieces of the climate legislation is, is, is investments. And so it's not just about the number, the dollar amount but how that money is moved and where that money is moved, that's gonna be really central to achieving a true just transition because more than just panels, it's about cooperatives and being a real stakeholder in your, a local renewable energy system. It's more than just offshore wind turbines. It's about job training and accessibility within all of these um, bubbles here. It's really at the heart of it about accessibility that's going to promote equity and resiliency. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Summer. That was amazing. Um, let me uh, just put, before we uh, move on, just, just a, a, a point of moderator privilege. I just, I want folks to really understand what Summer just laid out. Like, Uprose does dragon slaying, but what happened over the last eight months is without precedent. Industry City was, I believe, the largest private rezoning 
uh, ever proposed in New York. So not only did Uprose kill a, a, a ridiculous application that would have taken uh, millions of square industrially zoned land away from that use, uh, but they doubled down and, and, and the, the fruition of, of literally over 10 years of advocacy finally saw the siting of offshore wind assembly, the largest offshore wind assembly contract given in US history on the Sunset Park waterfront. What you have seen is essentially just transition, uh, just trans, uh, just transition, um, uh, just model embodied by Uprose's work. And this is exactly the kind of vision that we've, we're seeing break out across the country. And just one last final word of, of, of personal privilege. The, there is, a, there is an, an arc of this work that we can trace back to um, maybe 2011 uh, when uh, NIJA, New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, and our members started working, in fact, with Pratt Institute on mapping the storm surge vulnerabilities of our industrial waterfronts. That was the first city, and that led to what we called the Waterfront Justice Project, which was the first citywide community resiliency campaign in New York City. Um, on the heels of that, when we went from being uh, accused of being chicken little alarmist, um, Sandy hits. And all of a sudden we went from being alarmist to being prescient, right? Literally within uh, two years of, of Sandy, we had what became the largest climate march in history, the People's Climate March. From the People's Climate March, all that's where the, the, the energy of New York City and New York State's environmental and climate justice movements really took off. Not only did we challenge the city of New York to adopt an 80 by 50 standard for New York City, which became the, the, a an international standard, but then that became what fed into Climate Works for All, New York Renews, and the moment that we're finding ourselves in. Um, and the reason I wanted to put that context is our, 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 our last and final, but by no means uh, last but not least um, speakers. Uh, I wanna introduce Anthony Karifa Rogers Wright. Um, Anthony Karifa Rogers Wright serves as New York Lawyers to the Public Interest, Director of Environmental Justice. In this capacity, Anthony guides and coordinates the organization's environmental justice strategy, litigation, organizing and advocacy initiatives. Prior to joining uh, NOPI or New York Lawyers, Anthony was the policy coordinator and Green New Deal policy lead with the Climate Justice Alliance, uh, the National Alliance, where he assisted with developing and promulgating local, state, and federal organizing and policy strategy for the Alliance's 74 grassroots frontline organizations across the country. Uh, we couldn't think of anybody better than Anthony to kind of connect all of it and, and uh, share with us how he sees this playing out at the federal level. Uh, so brother Anthony, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, oops, I'll meet myself there. Oh, brother Eddie, thank you so much. Um, it's, it's just amazing to be here uh, with, with you um, and my sister, uh, Nell and Summer, who you're absolutely right, we'll get more into like the amazing work that Uprose does. I myself was not surprised when they defeated in Industrial City because I know about their organizing, you know, and, and um, I still, I still, you know, ha had a drink because I was very happy about that. And, um, and of course, my brother Stefan, who, uh, um, you know, uh, New York lawyers, proud members of the uh, New York Renews Coalition. And, you know, I'm going to share my screen in a second, but I think that, um, you know, as I talk about, you know, um, Eddie was absolutely right. I mean, it's, we're not going back to like a, a biggie Tupac, you know, type of beef of New York and California, but but it's true that that New York has definitely surpassed California in, in, in so many ways. And, and I'm actually very, very um, I'm, I'm proud of that um, because of the work um, that that uh, these incredible groups have, have been doing for so many years. But I also, um, as I will start my screen now, you know, I think that it's really, really important. Um, let's see, it's my son. There you go. Um, more bean, bro. A, more bean. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, absolutely sorry, folks. no. I just, I, I just saw I mean, that. I mean, the, the quick story is, is that that Eddie and his partner and Elizabeth are partly responsible for being, they actually introduced me to his mom. So, um, you know, but after I mean, the I'm, people's climate march, that's right. And I, I'm still, I'm still waiting for the college fund checks that y'all promised, but sorry, we'll, we'll talk about that later. But, um, 
you know, um, when we're talking about all the work that Anel and, 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 and Summer and um, uh, staff and lifted up, it is uh, in this process of scaling up and scaling out. The road to national climate initiatives starts in New York. That That's just, uh, uh, can't, could not be any more true through the examples that you've seen. But I do think it's important to give a quick historical, historical perspective to how we have gotten here. You know, uh, Sister Summer is absolutely right. Um, we've seen this so many times with uh, frontline environmental justice terms, they get co-opted, they become popular, they get hashtagged. Um, and a lot of people think that we got to this moment because, you know, uh, uh, a, a big green in the form of Thanos collected all the climate justice infinity stones, snapped his finger, and then like, you know, oh, just transition, climate justice just came about. But that's absolutely not true. This is years and decades of work and we, we, we need to lift it up. Um, so just a, a brief history, 68, uh, we know that uh, Dr. King uh, led a, a, a Black Memphis sanitation workers garbage strike same uh, uh, around, around the same time that he died. Um, Rob uh, Abasco in 69, uh, uh, California Rural Legal Assistance files a suit that results in the ban of DDT. Again, this is this is a, a grassroots frontline black and brown people making federal change from, from the get-go. United States Public Health Services did certify that lead poisoning was disproportionately impacting African-American and Latino children. Uh, this continues to this day, unfortunately, um, in 79. Um, before some of us were even born, right? Linda McKeever Bullard, uh, who is the uh, uh, partner of uh, Dr. Robert Bullard, of course, some know, uh, know him as the father of environmental justice, won't get into that, but she filed the first civil rights uh, suit uh, that, that's challenged the siting of a, of, of a waste facility in um, a, a frontline black brown um, um, community. Um, from there, and you know, in 82, we have Dr. Benjamin Chavez, you know, uh, citing uh, polychlorophate by, by fennel sites in Warren um, um, uh, County, uh, North Carolina. Um, uh, and this is one that we, we get the coin, uh, the term coined of, of environmental racism. Um, and and I'm, I'm going to skip ahead, but because I think that the uh, two issues that I really want to, uh, three uh, uh, points in time that I really want to lift up, the principles of environmental justice were released in 1991. Um, and the reason why I think this is extremely important, because Brother Eddie was talking about, you know, Green New Deal this and Green New Deal that. Eddie was amongst one of the first people that I called when the Green New Deal resolution was released, because I was not as blown away by that as I was by the 1991 principles of, of environmental justice. And to put that in perspective, 91, this is like a year before Wu-Tang came out with the 36 chambers. So like that, that's how long this has like been around and, and leading the way here. Of course, in 94, Bill Clinton signed Executive Order 12898 into law. And then equally important, 96, the Hamez Principles for Democratic Organizing comes out. Eddie always teases me. Uh, I, I literally have been uh, for two years in a row on a pilgrimage to the Hamez, New Mexico. And Eddie's like, you're going to go find the scrolls. I haven't found them yet, but I'm, I'm going to find them one day and I'm going to hold them up. Because um, this is important because a lot of people, speaking of scrolls, um, have this idea that the Green New Deal was going to be this proverbial Moses that led us through the, 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 the floods and the waters of, of, of environmental racism, but it was really rooted in this frontline wisdom uh, by the founders and the elders of the environmental justice and climate movements. So, I mean, and, and just giving an example, right, um, the Egypt principles, they formed the foundation of all of this. This is 91, if you're looking at some of the things that, that the founders of these movements were saying, universal protection from nuclear testing, extraction, we're using words like extraction in 91, production and disposable, uh, a disposal of uh, toxic waste. Um, we're talking about um, lifting up the free prior and informed consent of indigenous and tribal people in, in 1991, even connecting um, environmentalism to an opposition of, of, of uh, 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 to militarism, uh, global militarism, and tying that together, and of course, upholding self-determination. So, you know, uh, th this is what forms the foundation of, of where we are today. And, and that's just extremely important to know and to lift up. Um, everyone has already been talking about uh, just transition versus just a transition. Um, that's very, very important. Just a transition, unfortunately, is what many people think of just transition now to Sister Summer's points, because it's been co-opted. We're hearing other people use this terminology and workers coming to us, you know, we love labor. We, we're all about labor, you know, in the environmental justice. These are workers who are, who are, who are having to choose between uh, putting food on the table and, and, and their public health. We don't uh, want to just take jobs away from people in order for a, a fossil free future. You know, that would be just a transition. You know, you have to fend for yourself. Just transition as um, uh, where this um, 
beautiful piece of work comes from from Movement Generation, also members of the 74 uh, Member Climate Justice Alliance, you know, um, uh, uh, with their our, our Power campaign. This is what that framework looks like. And as we're drawing down um, uh, the money from international, national to local, what we're scaling up is the ideas, the wisdom, and the solutions. And that's where we are today. And this is what I'm really, really happy to talk about. So at, you know, right there, the foundation, frontline communities, and as we've seen with Uprose and Nija, organizations accountable to those communities. You cannot beat industrial city with certain, you know, organizations that like to helicopter in after their, you know, uh, episode of CNN, you know, uh, uh, think they're going to come to Sunset Park and, and, and they're not accountable to the communities and think they're going to be able to organize. You, you can't do it. You cannot have good policy initiatives without um, uh, grounded organizing. And if you don't believe me, ask Waxman Markey how that worked out because it didn't work out too well. And everything comes up from that. So uh, that's why I say it's, it's frontline communities to New York City, to New York say to the federal government. Um, the three previous speakers already broke this all down. At the local level, the Climate Mobilization Act, um, enormous, huge. And, and yes, we are going to stop Cuomo in multiple ways, but um, specifically, we want him to also keep his hands off of um, um, our home rule in New York City. We're going to keep Local Law 97 intact to keep the Climate Mobilization Act intact. At the state level, Brother Stefan really broke down the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. And the influence of, 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 of CLCPA, it, it just cannot be stated um, um, even more. Um, um, prior to the um, uh, federal and executive initiatives that I'm going to name, you know, the, the presidential uh, primaries for the Democratic Party, you couldn't find like a candidate who was serious that did not reach out to um, a, a Climate Justice Alliance member, because the idea now is that it's not so much that your policy is inadequate if it doesn't have backing of the groups that, that are represented on this call today, it's illegitimate, and, and they understood that. Uh, uh, one thing that, that, you know, when Sister Summer was talking about just transition, I remember that um, at the time when I was with CJA, you know, I had uh, been on a phone call with Governor Jay Inslee, who was a presidential candidate. And the next day, he had a CNN town hall. And my previous executive director, the great Angela Adrar, was like, yo, what did you say to this brother? Because he said the term just transition in the first five minutes of that like town hall, like it, it, was, it was like, I was just like, wow. You know what I mean? I, imagine like how um, Run DMC felt when they first heard the BC boys, like just like, you know, like what's going on here? That That's like what Jay Inslee did. And so there's so much influence from Senator Sanders' uh, uh, climate plan to uh, Senator Warren's, uh, Booker's, and, 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 and of course the uh, eventual vice president, um, now Vice President Harris. The Justice 40 initiative that we're hearing about that came out of uh, Biden's uh, January executive order that called the, the 40 comes from the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Okay, that, that 40%. Now, um, we are having a little bit of a discussion because again, this is what uh, Sister Summer said, words being co-opted. Uh, they changed it a little bit to say the benefits of investments. And we're saying, no, 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 40% of the money. <laughs> okay, we, we, we know, you know the difference because if you build a bunch of like emission uh, or, or electric vehicle charging stations in our hoods where we don't have like zero emission vehicles, that, that's not a benefit, you know, for us. You might be able to count that, but that's not a direct benefit, you know, to us. If we can't even like uh, uh, pump up our, our bike tires on that thing. So we want the money. So because we know how to invest it as the great program is a perfect example of that. We'll, we'll take the money and we'll determine what the benefits are. But still, that was majorly influenced by the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Um, uh, last year, uh, uh, Representative Raul Halva from Arizona released the Environmental Justice for All Act. I mean, it basically is plagiarizing the CLCPA, which is cool because, I mean, he did that bill with members of CJA and with members of the Environmental Justice Movement, but heavily, uh, uh, again, influenced. Um, Ocasio-Cortez and Harris released the Climate Equity Act um, and, and took the term disadvantaged communities that came out of the CLCPA. And I can't tell you how many other pieces of legislation, including the uh, recently introduced EJ Mapping and Data Collection Act by uh, Representative Cori Bush, who we absolutely love, and Senator Ed Markey, who we like enough. Um, um, and, 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 and then uh, the Clean Future Act. And I want to say this, you know, while we do not support all aspects of the Clean Future Act because of its reliance on false solutions like um, green unicorn science technology, things like carbon capture and sequestration, solar radiation, green 
hydrogen, you know, um, the Clean Future Act. If you look at the EJ section, though, I mean, so influenced by CLCPA. Frank Pallone is just across the river in New Jersey, but even provisions that would prevent any new development that would have a negative impact or disproportionate impact on the EJ community would no longer uh, be able to be built. Um, and then um, I'm, I'm happy to say that um, two of our own in New York, um, Senator Gillibrand, along with uh, Representative Yvette Clark from Brooklyn, are about to um, uh, introduce a peaker uh, uh, replacement plant and, and um, building off of the uh, report that Summer uh, was just talking about that will call for the replacement of peaker plants within five years and replace with uh, uh, renewable energy storage that doesn't include uh, green hydrogen, by the way, through the, the uh, leadership of, of NIJA. But if you look in that bill, the uh, uh, they, they use disadvantaged communities, and that's what they're building off of. So, um, you know, this all to say, you know, in, in wrapping up, that the, the reason why this is such an exciting time for, for, for uh, uh, New York State, all eyes are on us right now. Uh, Brother Stefan talked about CLCPA and the work we're doing with New York Renews to also get uh, the Climate Community and Investment Act ratified, the sister companion bill to CLCPA, because we have also learned in New York um, how to uh, not introduce a, a, an emissions pricing tool. Um, we learn from the mistakes of Washington State. We learn from the mistakes of, of, of Waxman Markey. And, and the reason why this is an emissions reduction tool that will eventually be a model for the rest of the nation, just look at the bottom of this slide. Frontline communities and organizations accountable to them are the ones who made this bill, not some um, uh, uh, professor behind a curtain from a different state, whether it's Am uh, Massachusetts. And you know, as a Yankee fan, I don't trust many things that come out of Massachusetts anyway, but um, um, that's a whole nother point. But this, this, this is a very, very important time. And, and, and Stefan is saying how you can get involved. Yes, these are the organizations that you need to support. I, I, I'm not, no disrespect to some of the, the bigger names that you've known, but the Uproses, the Nijas, and the New York Renews, they're the ones that are actually getting things done because environmental justice for us is not a theory or like a placeholder or like a, a badge that you put on your jean jacket like back in the day, you know, with the, the heavy metal uh, uh, bands and whatnot, and, or it's not an ingredient that you put into a pot and just stir. This is a set of principles, a set of practices that links organizing, synergizes organizing with policy development. And, and it's also important that our communities, um, you know, they also produce organizers and scientists and lawyers and policy analysts and architects and engineers, and we rely on them. I, I, again, GRID is, is, is a perfect example of that. So um, please continue supporting these communities and, and, and these uh, community-based organizations so that in the process of doing that, you are also affecting change at the federal level. So um, that's my spiel and um, I'll stop there. Thank you again, Eddie, for having me. This has been amazing. Thank you, as always, Anthony. Um, let me just do my little thing here. Um, so yeah, before, before uh, you know, we have a couple of questions from, from, from the audience, but before we turn to them, I think it might be useful for us to have a, a conversation among the panelists. Um, and, you know, I get promised you all, we're, we're not, this ain't gonna turn into a New York Renews policy committee sub meeting or anything like that. We're gonna talk, but, 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 but I just gotta ask, Stefan, did you get my text about the... No, no, I'm just kidding. For, so here's my question for, for, for the panelists. Um, what are you most excited about and what are you most worried about in terms of all the climate policy, just transition work uh, that we're all doing either, you know, with our, our individual organizations or collectively? Because, of course, we are movement. So uh, let, let me, um, if, if, uh, if I can, let me start with, with a... Net, well, maybe I could just open it up because I don't want to... Put people on the spot, but whoever wants to go first, what are you? What are you most excited about uh, in, in in the immediate future, and what are you most concerned about? I can I can jump in first. So what what I'm most worried about is the ability of the fossil fuel industry to just try to disregard the CLCPA altogether. We have the most aggressive climate policy in the country, if not the world, and yet we have fossil fuel companies still proposing to build new fossil fuel infrastructure in New York City. Um, and I just, I just can't understand how the state would allow that, would permit that, would you know, give the green light to that. 
So, so that's what I'm most nervous about. Um, you know, I, I've been saying often that I thought passing the bill was the hardest part, but it turns out implementing the bill is way harder. And, you know, <laughs> ensuring that, that all the targets and goals that we put in there are met is, is way harder. And all of us are, are deep into that work. And what I'm most excited about, and, and I mentioned this in, in my presentation, is Renewable Rikers and building something that's so big and so real and has such an important history um, and is such an important opportunity to shift that history, that negative history that has impacted Black and Latino communities in, in our neighborhoods and our communities for generation and turn it into something that is creating jobs, that is, you know, providing clean energy that is providing, you know, better wastewater management that's providing better organic waste management. I'm just excited about what that can really become um, and how that can become a model for, for other cities and other places. Yeah, I just, you know. I, yeah, I, no, I, I would have to agree. You know, I, I think that right around the time that my mom's had like the talk with me was uh, around the time of the Exonerated Five, right? The people that's known as Central Park Five. And I mean, R Rikers Island has, has always just represented this like dark area of, of like oppression for, for the entire city. So, so to see, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 abolitionist movement coming together with the EJ movement to make this happen is, is just absolutely incredible. And I think you're absolutely right. This can be a model, you know, just so you know, um, uh, I think it was yesterday, the day before I was talking to uh, Representative Bush about this, who was very much an abolitionist and was like, she was like, this is what I'm talking about, right? And, and she's about to introduce a Green New Deal for cities that would be paid for by defunding the police. And she's going to use renewable Rikers as an example in her preamble. Um, in terms of what I'm most worried about, yeah, it's also, it's really these false solutions that that are being, you know, that are all over the place. I mean, it's like being in a swarm of just horrible ideas, you know, every, and, and, and the fact that it, it's coming from, I'll put it to you this way, we are seeing more bipartisanship in the Senate for carbon capture and, and false solutions, right, to bail out the fossil fuel industry than we saw to bail out the people from a pandemic and to mm. bail out the people from a climate crisis. That, that, that's just very worrisome to me because, um, you know, and, and uh, my, my dear sister from CJA, I see she's on the call since Cynthia Mayon uh, did an incredible panel today, um, a, a congressional briefing about these false solutions. And, and it, I hope they're not falling on deaf ears because they're expensive, they're energy intensive, and, and they're just not going to work. I mean, I, I just can't believe that in 2021, the, 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 the thing that the scheme that people are coming up with is to suck air uh, uh, emissions out of the sky and sweep it under the rug. You know what I'm saying? Like, so that being my five-year-old, he can deal with it when he gets older. It's like, this is the best that you can do. And it's just like the, the environmental version of the F-35 fighter jet, you know, trillions of dollars for a plane that's never, you know, going to fly. Because I, if it was as easy as just sucking the air out and putting it on the red, like, you know, the frontline communities, we would have thought about that a long time ago, you know? So that, that because uh, we saw in the uh, uh, last administration, in the, in the final omnibus bill that got through, $7 billion uh, was, was, was dedicated to these false solutions. And then another bill that just got released this week for CCS, another $5 billion. Um, um, what uprose and what nature can do with $5 billion? <laughs> oh my, you know, a tenth of that, you know? Um, so, um, and, and I'm also like with UNL and making sure that the, sister, you hit the nail on the, the implementation phase, right? Policy, a lot of people think it stops when the ribbon is cut or, you know, uh, we get the hashtag and then forget about the implementation. All of a sudden, you know, our, our money is not getting to our communities or to the people who are actually accountable to the community. So I'm really hoping that we, we, we're on top of that. Thank you so much, Anel and Anthony. Um, Summer and Stefan, what, what, what are you guys most concerned about and what are you most hopeful about? I would say I'm most concerned, um, and I see that the Hermes principles were dropped in the chat a little earlier, most concerned with the inability to create just relationships. And that, you know, in this work, we, we, we know who we're fighting. There's the clear um, entities, industries that we're fighting, the fossil fuels um, industries, and, you know, the, 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 as, as the list goes on. And um, another big 
piece of making the work move slowly is fighting uh, not only um, more obvious um, people and industries, is having to constantly also fight well-intended um, organizations and people who want to come in. And you know what has been mentioned in terms of um, really perpetuating an extractive model of partnership and collaboration of taking ideas and getting funded for it, making decisions for frontline communities, um, really running um, different agenda solutions into different directions that are not accountable to communities at all. Um, and so that's that's something I'm super concerned about, uh, that we're super concerned about in terms of really being able to not only move the work along, but move the work along at the pace and the speed it needs to be implemented. Uh, I'm definitely most excited about, um, you know, all of our work in Sunset Park, um, you know, really, really um, developing or the grid and operationalizing the grid and the campaigns to be a model, you know, and that not only a model for the types of development models, um, but the mo a model in terms of process, in terms of how to implement the CLCPA, a green reindustrialization of our waterfront. And what does that look like in terms of moving funding, creating jobs, reducing emissions, um, developing renewable energy? What does that look like um, in a just transition model on the ground? So that's what I'm most excited about given the momentum of not only the victories we've had in the last year, um, but the all the victories that come um, from the fruition of the years and years, decades of work from the movement. You're here. Thank you, Summer. Stefan, how about you? Um, man, there's uh, such great answers. I'm not sure I have that much to add. I mean, I, I just, I found myself agreeing and nodding. I mean, I feel like Summer should present on victories every day. Like, we just need that reminder that there's like beautiful victories that communities have led because so much of the time that's not. So, um, you know, what gives me hope is like hearing that from from grassroots leadership like uprows um i'll also you know i if i wanted to be slightly cynical i'm kind of hoping we have a new governor in the next couple of months and um so that also gives me some hope after many years of not working well with this one um and then what worries me just to build off things folks have said is you know a lot of what we accomplished with the clcpa was despite people saying you can't do that that's impossible and, and so much of what has been demanded and won by grassroots folks in the EJ movement, it, it's not just well-intentioned folks who have their own ideas. It's like well-intentioned folks, our allies, government officials who literally can't envision these victories and, and then hold up the compromises we get to when we've won and say, look, this is what you got is pretty good. Like, that's amazing. Thank you for fighting for this. But don't realize like that it was only aiming for the stars that got us, you know, the moon and some 40% of the funding. Here, here. Thank you, Stefan. And uh, yeah, we in the impossible business in the EJ world. And, 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 and Stefan, thank you so much for not lifting up your anti-Yankees uh, chat earlier in the... Uh, the so I'm going to turn now to uh, some... Uh, and, and by the way, uh, for, for the summer knows this, I'm, the other panelists may, I think Stefan and, 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 and I'll know this, um, you can never expect short answers from a Pratt crowd. So I am going to be sharing a, a couple of thesis level, but I'm going to ask them really fast. So let me, bear with me. Uh, let me scroll up. And we have first, um, I, I think this is for Stefan, but I think this could be open for, for any of the panelists. Would a requirement for New York City to have and maintain a well-considered comprehensive plan help with climate and environmental justice issues? What is good and not so good about the current proposal uh, by the city council? Uh, so Stefan, you want to take a crack, but I, I actually this is open to anyone. I mean, and Nell, I'm sure also, and, and others can, I mean, I'll, I'll just take a, take a step back. I mean, I actually don't know the details of the current city proposal. I know a lot of what's been going on over the last few years. And I mean, what we've seen is consistently not listening to grassroots folks, consistently focusing on the kind of big shiny projects like a seawall or, um, 
or, or other kind of easy benchmarks that they can identify that they can bring in private capital for. And so I think, you know, without even having looked at it, I can envision what the current proposal is and be very dubious of it when in fact what we need are the kind of transformative solutions that, you know, the Climate Mobilization Act, as you said, is we're in the impossible business. And, you know, what the council is looking at uh, or has been looking at is, you know, what was kind of possible already six years ago. Yeah. I, if I'm not mistaken, this may be a reference to the five borough resiliency plan. I think the council, uh, and, and, and you, I think you're right, Stefan, if, if memory serves, it's not a deep, comprehensive piece of legislation, but it's necessary in, to address what Anel was saying at the beginning. Like, you know, it can't all be resiliency investments for lower Manhattan, for God's sake. But um, I, I, I believe that's the, I don't know if you want to, you want to do a little five borough resiliency uh, clapback or no, we can move on to the next question. Um, I mean, with the five borough uh, resiliency plan, I think that there's a lot of already great work um, that is being done, a lot of great research, community led and done, you know, by the city itself that can really, that we can really build on. I, I don't want people to think that we have to start from zero. There's already been a lot of assessments and I'm just tired of the reports upon reports upon reports that the city keeps re uh, releasing. I'm ready for action. I'm ready for construction. I'm ready for resiliency. Um, and I also wanna, wanna speak to the often siloed approach that the city takes. I think it's often really challenging even when we were working on thinking, of, thinking about coastal protection in Hunts Point um, the city thought only of flood risk reduction and not of anything else, not of the urban heat island mitigation benefits, not of the air quality benefits, not of the recreational benefits and waterfront access that it provides to, to the community. Their cost benefit analysis was only about the flood risk reduction and we need to move away from just a very siloed approach to policy and planning. Thank you. Uh, unless there's others, let me move on to the next question, which I think we are, I think a couple of you have already addressed. Uh, what about the interborough plan for jail? I guess for, I guess the Rikers, I'm not sure. What, what about the interborough plan, I guess, to replace Rikers, uh, which will also impact neighborhoods environmentally and promote gentrification? We need to be talking about defunding police and an anti carceral driven New York City state, too. Um, yeah, I, I think a couple of you guys touched on it, but anyone want to um, elaborate further on? Yeah, I definitely don't want to speak on behalf of the criminal justice advocates that we collaborated with on Renewable Rikers. Um, I think that those questions are, are better um, put to them. Um, but I will say that, you know, we were supportive of, D, you know, defund NYPD because if you look at the city budget, you can see where a lot of the funds are going and where a lot of the funds are lacking. Um, and that needs to be addressed. So I think that that's, that's something that we need to do. And, yeah, Anthony? Anthony? Yo, please, go ahead. Oh, just to add one, I mean, we worked in my prior role on, on some of these issues and I'll just say, I mean, one of the things that's been really powerful and important about the work on renewable Rikers and, and to shut down Rikers was to say, you know, there's a false dichotomy that the city and the police department are, and, and others are saying, where it's like, you can have Rikers or you can have lots of prisons all over the city. And the reality is we have policy tools. We have legislation that's been enacted and is proposed to reduce incarceration. Had we managed to hold on to the massive victory on bail reform, like many, many things are moving in that direction. And it's it's a real strength of the decarceration movement in New York to say these solutions are not incumbent on us to figure out how we how we close that jail without building other ones. We should close that jail and not build other ones. And we need to figure out how to answer that question. Thank you, Stefan. Um, any other comments on, on this? If not, um, next we have, uh, does the vocabulary of climate change resilience include the word retreat? And if so, where? Probably retreating from conference calls, but I don't know what, what we, we all know what, the, what manage retreat folks. What do you, uh, we, I, I know I have, I have retreated from manage retreat, but uh, it's a real live conversation. So uh, what do folks have to say about that? 
or if y'all want to ponder, I could go on to the next one. I, I can just jump in quickly on that one. I, I won't say much sure. about it. Um, and Anthony, I don't know if you are muted, so you can jump in too, but um, I'm not ready to talk about manage retreat when de Blasio is over here saying, oh, let's extend lower Manhattan and build high rises as a form of coastal protection. I'm not ready to talk about managed retreat where when they're building more high rises in the Williamsburg waterfront and the Long Island City waterfront along like Flushing Creek and gentrification is happening at hyperspeed. So I'm not ready to talk about that until we address these other issues. Yeah, the only thing I would add is even Chuck Schumer just now kind of uh, blocked a provision for for management uh, managed retreat um, because it would affect the uh, insurance prices of homeowners near the coast and like uh, some of the communities that Summer just named. So um, you know, if you take it down to, to New Orleans, some people saying, "Oh, we're just going to have to uh, write it off." You know, I don't want to talk about that until we talk about why the uh, oil and gas industry hasn't ponied up the five hundred million dollars that they owe to the people of Louisiana, including the the Luxie Chittimaca uh, Choctaw tribe and the United Home and Nation people for all the oil and gas drilling that is making land disappear. So there are other conversations, agree with uh, um, Anel 100% that we can have well before uh, a managed uh, a retreat. Um, these are also, again, not theoretical places. They're, they're real communities with real people facing uh, real challenges. And um, the idea that they have to get up and, and run um, uh, because of, of a crisis they had, they had little hand in creating is, is just um, kind of myopic to me. So we're going to we're talking about let's manage retreat first from luxury housing on the waterfront, and then we could building more, and then we could. Gotcha. Uh, let me move on to the. Oh, next and Eddie, one. manage retreat from capitalism. <laughs> the C word. It was bound to come up. Hold on a second. Um, uh, this is a, I think three part question. I told y'all that's how Pratt rolls. Hold on a second. All right. How have uh, how have these efforts? I'm assuming it's our collective work and efforts. How have our efforts worked alongside the issues of immigration, particularly sanctuary, uh, especially as increasing numbers of climate refugees are anticipated? Um, I'm just going to do the three questions, three parts of y'all. So that's the first question about uh, immigration, our work, especially climate refugees. And um, second, for communities facing flooding, in addition to reducing flood exposure and adaptation, do people have supports to access mobility if they need retreat? Um, I'll, 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 I'll stop there. I, I think summer has summer that that means no BQX. I'm sorry. That's just, I, I just had to do a little trolley slap. Sorry. Um, for communities facing flooding in addition to, no, this is the same question. I'm sorry. Was, they felt so strongly about it. They asked it twice. Okay. So, uh, those are the two questions who wants to, uh, jump in. Uh, the, the climate refuge. Uh, Anthony, is there anything on 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 the CJ has been dealing with, uh, and 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 some of our international um, um, uh, brother sister movements? What? How is the climate refugee and and immigration otherwise playing out in some of the climate justice uh, conversations? Yeah, you know, um, uh, CJA member, uh, Global Grassroots Justice, led by the the, the, the brilliant uh, uh, Cindy Weissner, you know, uh, uh, really, you know, get into this, which is why, um, you know, they they have uh, pushed. Um, a feminist Green New Deal, a, fem a feminist economy lens. We know for a fact that the majority of people displaced um, in uh, so-called developing nations are, are, are women. Um, and so um, just lifting that up and then also lifting up um, where the, the, the role that the United States has played in that. So um, you're we, we talked about increased militarism um, earlier. We know that we have also spread um, uh, poisonous practices like fracking you know, to, uh, to developing nations, in some cases um, um, complicit in the assassination of our dear sister, uh, Beta Caceres. Um, but, but so what is the role that, that, we, that we're uh, playing in that? Um, and, and some of the things that we've done to uh, disrupt societies from Chile to Guatemala, Nicaragua, um, 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 et cetera, through our intervention um, in, in their uh, dispute. So I would say that uh, there has been discussion, uh, obviously massive solidarity, you know, with the immigrant community um, um, globally and worldwide. But uh, the United States has played a, a, a unique role in that. And the idea, and IET as well, you know, um, and Puerto Rico with the Jones Act, you know, I, I mean, uh, so we, we have to, I would say that we, uh, the, the real push is for us to look at ourselves and, and, and understand that, like, the idea is that 
we don't think that people are, are just like dying to come to the United States, you know, um, uh, that the situation is that has become that dire, that people are risking their lives in that trek, especially from Central America uh, uh, to get here. So what is it, what is our role being that we're 5% of the population emitting 20 to 25% of the global emissions and helping them to stay where they are, you know, um, and, 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 you know, um, I know that there's a global climate fund that the United States has gotten back into, but it's, it's like, I don't know, like a hundred billion dollars that's that that that's that's like not nearly um enough and then we also have to talk about that in the context of why um we can't you don't see too many ej groups jumping up and down about the paris climate accords because um, we don't see these nations who are directly responsible for massive migration stepping up and holding themselves accountable so um that's that's really the lens i've seen it at so far gotcha can't talk about climate refugees or immigration all of this in the context of climate change without talking about geopolitics and, and, and empire, right? And the rest, um, anyone else have any other responses to this? Um, if not, I could go on to the next question. Yeah, please. I can also jump in here and say like, you know, in terms of, um, you know, displacement from climate change, like that is at the heart of um, really addressing that within a just transition as well. Um, you know, really wanting to lift up here the Climate Justice Alliance's just recovery framework um, that only, you know, in, within a just transition itself, that the resources and decision making would be, you know, centered around these same communities, the frontline communities most vulnerable to not only the impacts of climate change but climate displacement as well. Are, um, you know, the ones who are directly making the decisions about resiliency solutions and recovery um, solutions as well. And so I, that's why I have said for the first part. For the second part, you. Um, not sure if that's the intention of the question, but wanting to really emphasize the ne uh, necessity of centering community-based planning in terms of, um, of, of accessibility to transportation, not only clean transportation, but um, transportation such as mass surface transit, safer pedestrian and street design and other um, community led priorities in terms of transportation that's really going to be able to um, help move communities out of harm's way when a climate event um, happens. And that, you know, what we're seeing, especially on the city level is a lot of um, groups really pushing um, for the, you, I guess you could say over development of bike lanes. And uh, you know we're seeing city bike on every single corner. I don't have a personal vendetta against city bike, but the you're assuming the people know how to ride bikes. You're assuming people um, in our communities are using bikes, um, and so we see the development of bikes and bike lanes in New York City as a very um, top-down extractive model of development of clean transportation in the city, um, where it should really be centering community planning in those decisions of what community needs in terms of access to clean, affordable, and reliable transportation. Gotcha, thank you. Um, we also have, uh, oh, this is, a, this is a perennial favorite. How do we encourage interagency communication? Let, let, let me open by saying um, when I when I when I when I work for for the mayor's office, um, I'm not going to yeah okay I'm going to do it because Ron is going to out me later. Yeah, I was I, I worked for the second Bloomberg term, but he wasn't a Republican. He had already become an independent. So so there. Um, but in the development of Plan YC 2030, which became the first um, effort by a major city to to plan for growth and climate change. Um, there was, in order for that plan to actually come together and for the initiatives to actually start um, uh, rolling out, you had to start busting down agency silos. Like, and that's what led the, to the first uh, mayor's office of long-term planning and sustainability. I think now it's the Office of Sustainability and, and Recovery, um, ORR. I always forget what the second R stands for, Recovery and Resiliency. Um, but yes, yeah, so so you you the interagency cooperation and communication is is real, meaning a real problem and 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 hopefully real opportunity done correctly. Um, yeah, folks, interagency communication. How y'all feel about that? I mean, I, I think it says, oh, oh, go ahead, Seth. No, yeah, no, go for it. No, 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 no. I, I, I've been talking. Go ahead, brother. 
I mean, I think everybody here probably has a lot of feelings. I think, you know, we, um, we struggled with this in developing the CLCPA and, and basically, you know, two key things we came away with one, you know, setting demands in law that force them an account to be accountable across agencies was one tool. Another is literally just requiring all or close to all of the agencies that might be implicated to sit down at a table regularly at the climate action council. And like, it, it is a huge endeavor and it took, like real work on their part, like to do it, something as simple as get all of the commissioners and agency heads and authority heads to come to those meetings. Um, and it's meaningful that they are, because if nothing else, it shows the folks under them in their agencies and authorities that they have to sit down and actually talk. Um, and, and hearing each other talk actually is having some minimal impact, right? Like it really is not that common that the ag commissioner has to sit down and hear from DEC about why things are the way they are. So, I mean, those are two things we've done uh, and, you know, continue to be, right? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say real quick that that's like sort of like the, the good part of it. But, but and, and I was going to say, it depends on what level of government you're talking about, because if you get to the federal government, you could get stuck into uh, a paralysis of analysis situation, and it takes too long for us to, uh, to get um, anything. But I mean, overall, I love the idea, but like Stefan said, there's got to be benchmarks and metrics and timelines so that, you know, it, it's actually serving the people because, I mean, you know what I'm talking about, y'all, you, you know, I, I mean, um, we, we, we can't have a situation where, where it's, you know, we, we get like a Kerner report in 1968, right? And then like, you know, 20 years later, we get strength and civil rights acts. <laughs> that, that, we don't have 20 years, you know, when it comes to the climate crisis anyway. So I'm all about them as long as they actually do something and we're not paying like a bunch of bureaucrats with our with our tax dollars um, to basically just give us a report that, that we already uh, knew about. Summer and Nell, any 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 anything more on, in, on interagency love and interagency uh, um, cooperation, communications, anything interagency? We'll take a memo. How do you guys feel? Anything you want to say about that? Or, <laughs> I no? think Stefan and Anthony got it. Um, you know, I'd say just very necessary, but need 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 streamlined processes and also um, need to talk to us, <laughs> not just to each other. Yeah, I think um, agree with with a lot of what Stefan said, and and the only thing I, I'll add is that there also has to be, you know, more intentional neighborhood based planning. So I think it's it's really helpful sometimes when you have multiple representatives from city agencies talk about how a certain policy or program plays out in a specific neighborhood, um, and sort of ground truthing the policy or or the data or you know whatever it might be. Thank you. And speaking of ground truthing, we we have I'm I'm assuming by now multiple questions from my from my co-host Ron Schiffman. Ron, you want to get get in here, brother? Have some fun. Okay. Uh, thank you all. I you know this discussion has been terrific. There is one thing though I do want to raise, and this may be lead to somewhat of a debate. I really agree with Anel and Anthony's response and the way they feel that government has dealt with low and moderate com income communities and particularly communities of color. Yet at the same time, as a planner, as someone who has access to information uh, that will show that there are areas of the city that within 20 to 25 years may be inundated by water, not flooding, but by surge that will jeopardize their lives and there may be a necessity 15 to 20 years to, or maybe even a week and a half from now, given some unforeseen circumstances, that they may have to vacate. How do we not talk to the people in that area to make sure that their needs are addressed, that their concerns will be addressed, rather than allow bureaucrats to sit and discuss it, allow scientists to sit and discuss it, allow planners to sit and discuss it, and not really address the issues uh, that may affect their lives and their children's lives. And it seems to me that it's incumbent upon us to really look at those areas that are threatened 
and get into a discussion about the way to deal with managed retreat. Now, we don't want to do it. We, I agree with you. We shouldn't be putting 60 to $100 billion on engineering feats that protect people. But what, how are we going to replace 15 to 20,000 units of public housing that may be wiped away in the city? You're not going to do that overnight. Those people will have to be dispersed and sent all over unless we begin to take that 15 and 20 billion and invest it in the people who may be jeopardized. So I just think we need to, the environmental justice community can't abdicate that responsibility. And it's hard because how are you going to talk to people that can't put food on the table tonight, can't pay the rent tomorrow and talk to them what might occur two weeks from now. And if you look at New Orleans, who was pushed out of that city? It was people who lived in the, four, in the ninth ward uh, and, and, and they've been forgotten because nobody right. talked about protecting their interests. So I think right. it's important we engage in that. And I would right. like a response from the audience. From I, the I think, I think, and, and I wanna just take a little a point of privilege here. I, I think when you heard um, uh, our not, in, not, our lack of a total embrace of a managed retreat conversation, I think what was what, what people are not hearing is that we're still building massive developments on the waterfront. So like to talk about managed retreat when we're still building luxury housing on the waterfront, you're talking to a movement that is a, we are, we don't have a lot of resources. We have to pick and choose our fights. And so to worry about what's gonna happen in 10 years when we're trying to get us to get to the Paris climate agreement metrics from five years ago, like I, I think it's just a question of what can a limited resource movement focus on? And so right now we have very real dangers, including, you know, uprose stopping industry city, which would have taken up uh, millions of square feet on the industrial waterfront, right? So, uh, but, but, anyway, but to that end, I don't know if anyone else has, has responses to this, because I don't want this to just be about managed retreat. We've been talking about a huge range of issues and job creation. I'm not sure how much job creation we're talking about with a just transition for managed retreat. So well, I, if folks, but, but let's, let folks answer that. And then, but, but if we could add more to the conversation to no, justice, because I'm worried we're, 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 we're in this. Eddie, Eddie, my point here is that we can create those jobs and we should create those jobs today to begin to build that affordable housing in areas that are safe, that we should stop right. the disconnect between the mayor's plans and the reality and, and stop building places like Auburn East, where they will, we know that they will be obliterated in one mortgage cycle. So what we need to do is to really begin to look at the way, at the places we build and how we build and begin to build them today so we have the resources for tomorrow. I, I, I think that's something that we would agree on. I don't disagree at all. We shouldn't be building any of that luxury housing on the waterfront. We shouldn't be building any luxury housing, which is one of the reasons we're going to have housing as a, as a right on April 9th as a major discussion. But I think as part of this just transition, we have to talk about where and how we build housing today that's truly affordable, not the fake housing affordability that we now have. But I just, it's an issue that we need the voice of the environmental justice community to speak up. And I understand, I understand that what, what the arguments are against it. And I- It's not, it's not a guess, Ron, it's just picking and choosing. We can't take on, I know we in the impossible business, but you got to give us, a, but the panelists, and, and any, any responses to the manager of retreat question? I mean, it seems to me because the, the brother brought up the uh, issue of like New Orleans that, I mean, you know, it wasn't just like the the, the flooding, right? It, it was the, the gentrification. And, and it seems that, you know, when you treat black and brown people as pollutants as well and get them out, 
there's, they seem to find a way to protect the, the new population, you know, when, when it when it comes in, like the levy system has drastically improved. In, I mean, it could only drastically improve, but it, it, it has improved since uh, uh, New Orleans became less of a chocolate city and more of a vanilla milkshake with drops of chocolate syrup sinking to the bottom of the cup. You know, they, they found magically found a way to protect these communities. So, I mean, I think that, you know, I hear what, I hear what you're saying. Uh, uh, Ron, I, I think it starts with just humanizing our people, and 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 like you know, and 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 seeing that these public housing places, as you're saying, which is a human right, are worthy of protection um, um, now. Because I, I get worried about like the idea of displacement. Um, we've displaced it. We've displaced people in this country for for centuries. Indigenous people from you know their rightful homelands to to Oklahoma. You know, I, I mean that's just wrong. And and I, um um and are we going to do the same thing? Um, because we don't have the political will, you know, to do that. I think that EJ communities have been talking about this. Sister Summer talked about just recovery, and and that really has those uh, 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 tenants as well. But. If you really want to help, Ron, yes, tell Bezos to give Nija Uproz, you know, that money instead of the groups that are, you know, backing false solutions. Just for the record, <laughs> I work with the groups in New Orleans to fight against that displacement because that could be controlled. Uh, in other places, it's difficult to control. And I think it's important. The issues you raise are critically important. Well, I have the floor, Eddie, if I can, we're, we're going yes, to... Uh, be closing in a few minutes. I do want to uh, address one success story that everybody didn't touch on, but I would like to attribute to the EJ movement, to the work that you did, Eddie, and Elizabeth did, and Maddie Stanislaus did a number of years ago in uh, getting New York State to be one of the leading uh, states that was addressing brownfield redevelopment. And last night, uh, Karen Kuby and a number of other people at the University of Pennsylvania and Pratt put together a session on housing and healthcare and, and green building. And what was cited was Via Verde in Marasena and Nos Quedamos, one of your members, both of which took advantage of that brownfield redevelopment to regenerate a neighborhood. By and the way, Anna's, on the, Anna, Anna's here. Hello, Anna. Nos quedamos. We love you. Sorry, keep going, Ron. And I just wanted to shout, give them a shout out because what that led to was not only the green, uh, the greening of those brown fields, but it led to one of the most innovative community initiated plans in the country, if not the world. It also led to one of the most innovative new mixed income housing developments <laughs> in the in the area that not only dealt with housing, but dealt with health issues and environmental issues. And in many ways that those environmental issues were raised by Yolanda Garcia while she was still alive. And it, that rejuvenation in that neighborhood came about because of the marriage between the environmental justice movement and community-based development. And it was really, I, it, it was a story that was told just last night. Jonathan Rose, a developer, gave credit to it, as well as uh, Jessica uh, Clemente from Nos Quedamos. And I thought it was important for the audience here to also hear that success, because some of those successes are forgotten because they were 27 years ago, as opposed right. to only 18 years ago. Exactly. Uh, uh, there's also a question from a really great scientists in, in the audience that I just saw rose, raised its hand from Klaus Jacob. And I just wanted to know if Eddie, if you have the time to allow it, to give him the floor for a second. Who's, who's going to tell Klaus no? The city's been trying. Nobody tells Klaus no. Hey, Klaus, how are you? Well, uh, I come back to the re uh, managed retreat question because if your communities our communities don't address this issue. The storms and sea level rise will manage it in an unmanaged way. Mm -hmm. And so to shove the issue aside, don't call it managed retreat, call it pursuing opportunities in highlighting elevations. 
I'm afraid that if you not address those issues up front, they will address, uh, address by Mother Nature. And that would be the worst thing that could happen. Mm -hmm. All right, folks. Well, that, that's why I'm always, I, I love the Pratt, uh, lecture series. No matter how much we do, there's always more folks gives us to do. So we, we will start fundraising. Uh, Ron, <laughs> uh, point us to the, found, the Managed Retreat Foundation. And let's just add that because we don't do enough, right? <laughs> but anyway, uh, thank you all for the, uh, for the additional work and hopefully the additional funding that will come with it. And um, Ron, any, uh, any last minute, uh, any last... Um, comments we got an upcoming uh, workshop don't we yes and first of all i want to thank stefan Anel, anthony summer and you for you know a very lively conversation and really a very important one uh, and i think one that we all really need to learn from uh, the other is that you know one of the other issues of major concern which is raised by a lot of the luxury housing being built is the whole issue of housing as a human right and, uh, and that housing has to be more than just four walls that surround us. And so on April 9th, we're having a session on housing as a human right. And we're going to have three really uh, great guests. The first one is Barika Williams, who is with uh, uh, ANHD, Rob Robinson, who uh, uh, is with uh, a variety of different organizations and is really been an advocate for the homeless. And Leilani Farha, who is from Toronto and has been uh, one of the rapporteurs in the UN uh, uh, around issues of housing and housing as a human right. And one of the things that we will also link to this is a film that was supposed to open a year ago, but because of the COVID epidemic didn't, and it's called Push. And it's a uh, it's a documentary, it runs for 90 minutes. We're not gonna do it during the lecture, but we've arranged with the people who've produced the film to make it available at below market rate for individuals to sign on. We also have some scholarships and a number of viewings that will, that will be really reduced uh, so that people can see it. We'll, it'll be, uh, uh, we'll get you the link on the 26th of March and it'll be uh, accessible to all the people who register for the conference until the ninth, uh, until the lecture where we'll uh, and the seminar with Leilani and Barika and Rob. And what we hope to do is talk about the issues around the right to housing and the equitable as part of the equitable recovery. And part of that is housing that's healthy, housing that is sustainable, and housing uh, that really meets the goals and and parameters, uh, both in its design as well as its development uh, that were outlined by all of you today. Uh, and I just, again, wanna thank you all and hope that you will join us and others and bring friends uh, to that session on April 9th. I wanna thank you all. And, and that's all I have to say. Nothing about, you know, tax increment financing. Or oh, Ron, you you didn't take the bait. All right, y'all. Um, let's all do a managed <laughs> retreat off this conference. Uh, thank you all. We'll see